I'm gonna, Gopi and myself have been working with Kate and a team of about 10 to 12 individuals uh, around for the last year, trying to figure out how we could document the fields that you need for AI and um, data sets. So data sets are, you have to train your AI before you even launch it. So there's two types of data sets that are involved with AI, being your training data set and your production data set. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But how I got involved in this, um, Kate and I worked many, many years ago at IBM. Um, I've been um, with NIS, NIS um, IEEE, and uh, ISO for quite a few years now, defining the standards that we need to, to put in place around AI. So I approached Kate because I wanted to put into the, all the standards that we're writing at IEEE how you could use SBOMs to document um, your AI so that you could get conformance or audibility associated with your AI applications. Because I'm sure you've seen the press out there. Um, a lot of AI applications, it's a little bit of the wild, wild west. They're defining their own licensings that are all over the map, um, and there needs to be a lot more control and ability to audit a piece of software um, and know sort of where the vulnerabilities are. So SBOMs seemed like a, a perfect solution that we can start to refer to, you know, an SBOM in, in these standards that are coming out in, you know, as we speak. Um, one of the things when it, you know many of us got together, we came up with a huge list of all the fields that should be in an SBOM. But it's not um, something that people are going to be able to understand overnight because um, AI applications, I actually just heard, um, they're not static. So they're dynamic. And the whole behavior of an AI application can change. The data is constantly changing, and there needs to, there's a new sort of phase associated with developers um, that they need to be monitoring the software and understand if it's, it's changed and adapt. Um, so it is bringing a new set of challenges to tool writers <laughs> um, because you, we, the data itself, um, as well as the app, can change as it's in production. And there isn't a release type cycle anymore. It, it's out there, it lives. Um, hopefully some of these developers are gonna put a, some kind of a time bomb in it, like an expiry date, but that isn't necessarily true right now. They, they're just going, um, they have to be pulled from the sh uh, production uh, versus sort of a new release. Um, but anyway, so one of the things that we did with um, Gopi um, and uh, um, Jean Kemp uh, from University of Illinois, I think it is. Um, we did uh, an exercise of doing card sorting and figuring out what fields from this long list that we came up with would be a good target list for 3.0. Um, so we'll go through that in a bit. Uh, we've been, you know, at um, Ireland and Japan um, and a number of conferences trying to talk up AI and data sets and get a good feel for what needed to go into the first release. So with that, um, I want to point out a few things like SPDX is, is um, part of our ecosystem now, but there are other things called uh, data cards uh, that Google um, Model cards, sorry, model cards. Uh, Google, um, with the software that they build, they build these. Somebody like ChatGDP has got a model card. So p some of the industry partners have actually started to document fields that really should be in the SBOM. There needs to be a, a generic place where you go for the fields, not a company-owned sort of module. Um, IBM has their uh, fact-checking cards. Um, I forget who has data cards, but there's a long list of sort of uh, industries out there that are documenting their metadata. And then there is a set of um, 
incident reports, vulnerabilities that are getting documented out there. The one that myself I like to use is the one that the partnership in AI is creating, which is the AIID and the A. IVD, um, but very similar to open source. Um, there was uh, an incident uh, this week, I guess last week. If, I don't know how many folks have played around with ChatGDP, but ChatGDP can generate code now, or it has been for a while. And there's an incident report that just got reported where ChatGDP was creating cybersecurity code. Um, malicious malware. Um, but what has come out, and it's now in the incident report, it's actually related to an open source uh, library that has uh, got a problem in it. So again, similar to what SPOMs have been doing for traditional uh, software, that will be an advantage in a tool um, for AI. But again, um, AI right now is primarily, I mean, open source is growing, uh, I will say that. Um, but it is like Microsoft, Google, I, even IEEE have a, a vulnerability uh, database that goes with it. So you have to go many places to find out all the security problems with your software right now. So having a tool that maybe scanned all of these and, and we have one, you know, uh, solution would be a good thing. But tools to me are important, uh, extremely important with these AI applications because they're becoming so complex and so large. Um, and then, as I say, the standards, there's so many standards out there. I think, um, you know, last count, there's like 1,200 standards associated with AI. So understanding sort of all the issues and what is a problem. I will point out with the incident reports, though, it's not just cybersecurity. So an incident report in the AI space can be a cybersecurity one, uh, an ethical one, like you have bias in the data and... I don't know if folks, um, some of the automated car uh, autopilot, autopilot um, models are actually have not been well trained with a diverse set of data, and hence the errors come. They hit people. They kill people. Um, so again, that is in that is in the incident report. So with that. One other observation uh, that, as tool writers, people need to be aware of, um, more and more of the AI. In the past, probably the, you know, the last 10 years that I've been building, it's been proprietary primarily. But there's a new concept called um, LLMs. ChatGDP is one of those categories. But it's now becoming a, a building block. So other software is going to be built on top of that. So understanding, again, your vulnerabilities within a building block is going to be crucial. So, so here's the long list that we came up, and it was even longer, of all the different things that an SBOM, hopefully, you know, five years from now, will include. But we're going to start with a shorter list. We went through a sorting exercise um, to figure out by using you know, s surveys and, and talking to people at different things to come up with the shorter list. Um, there's the incident uh, database that I mentioned um, that we all should become very familiar with. And ideally for, a, uh, I come from a tools background, by the way. I was with Red Hat for a lot of years and IBM. Um, but it really, this incident report is bigger than what is currently captured for cybersecurity issues. It actually catch, uh, captures like transparency, um, you know, black box type things, uh, bias, um, et cetera, in the incident report that go into these. So it is far bigger than what traditional software captures for this. Um, that's an example of an incident report. So a couple of use cases. Um, actually, I was on a call just recently, and somebody pointed out there are a number of types of um, 
of models and database. You have your traditional close uh, or open source ones. I will point out that uh, actually in the last 24 hours, a note from Google um, just got leaked to say that um, chat or GPT-4 uh, all J is an open source model that has been circulating. And it is actually the Google um, Donuts or email to the 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 AI team within um, in their group. It's actually better than Bart, um, which is their you know proprietary model that they were coming out with. And what the note said was, we really have to start watching open source because they're actually jumping farther ahead than some of the industries. So that's cool to see. But we do need to figure out how people have to document these models and data sources. And then you have here in the bottom right, um, I think that's your closed source. So something like, um, you know, I, I don't know, uh, Tesla's autopilot model is closed. Nobody can see sort of the innards of it. But there are two different flavors of whether your code is closed or your um, model is closed. So you can have a combination of one of them's being open and one of them is being closed. So we're gonna have to bring that concept into our SBOMs as we go forward. Um, again, um, these are just types of cybersecurity issues that we're seeing. Um, and with uh, the mobile, so in 2.3, we actually worked with Kate and T, the SPDX team to get the core things that an AI application would need. So they're actually already there. Um, some of them got reworded to um, build time, et cetera, et cetera. But they're already in 2.3. So as an AI developer, I can start to build SBOMs. Um, but where it gets fun and interesting is um, the new ones that are coming into 3.0. And those are things like um, with an AI application, you have this concept of hyperparameters. Um, Chat GDP in particular, I think, has 3 billion uh, hyperparameter uh, options that you can do. So again, the scale associated with AI applications and what gets documented in an SBOM is something that we would love to get more feedback on. The other one that got added, um, there's something, so you have to pre-process your data before you put it into an AI bomb application or a model application. Um, so you have to cleanse your data. Um, so there's now a field to document you know, all the different techniques that you used to um, get your data ready for an AI application. The next one is uh, the model explainability um, aspect. Um, and again, uh, model cards have this in their fields, and we felt it was needed for uh, an SBOM. So, a couple of examples. Um, so, one of the things I've been doing is to see if the information is actually out there that people could grab. Um, and then, as looking at an SBOM, would I be able to audit, come in and audit that software and be able to say it's got a high risk, low risk, et cetera? And so, this one is um, a da world data set that has all the finances and the interest rates, et cetera, et cetera. It's an open source, at least it's the Canadian version of this is open source. I'm not sure all around the world it is. But you can see right now, that I've filled in sort of what are some of the core components that would go into an SBOM. But there's very, very little information about build time, release time, et cetera. And to me, uh, or in ISO or IEEE standards term, it means the transparency of this uh, data set is is not very it's low so if I'm going to be using this data set that's a flag to me that there you know maybe maybe I shouldn't use it um, 
But again, it's just to get a feel for how an S-bomb could be used. Um, again, some of the new data set fields that we have is, you know, how did you collect your data? So again, going back to the, uh, the chat GDP example, they have um, just taken every da data that's publicly available in, on the internet. So they would have to flag that that's how, how they got their data in the SBOM. They would have to indicate the size. Um, I did some work with um, GM, and they gave me um, two billion rows of data um, for everything that you would want to know about a car and its performance, et cetera. So again, they would fill in that information. Um, Again, uh, I currently working in I, uh, IEEE in their, um, I guess it's biometrics type standards. And so with all of this, there's data noise. So you have to be able to know it. You also need to know sensors, the hardware that's actually tied to your AI application. Um, you need to understand your known biases, sens sensitivity of your personal data, um, anom anonymous methods, uh, confidential level. So how confident you're going to have to de define um, that your predictions of your AI are going to work or not. And then the data availability, whether it's public, private, etc. So those are some of the new fields coming in 3.0, um, and that we'll start to see propagated. Really, nobody that I have been able to find that um, builds AI applications currently is building SBOMs. So this will also be an awareness and try and get people um, doing this activity. Um, again, using the data set, um, so I took a look at uh, GPT-3, which is a model uh, that is what ChatGDP uses. And with the new uh, data s or fields that we we're proposing, all of them are red because uh, they're not in the model card, they're not in any of their documentation, they're not in any of their white papers. So again, me being an auditor at IEEE, I would look at that and say, oh my god, I, I, it's too risky. No way am I going to use that code. Um, again, we talked about the the world data set. Um, there's a little bit more on the GPT-3 example. Um, one thing that we're going to have to start working with the license folks is there's new um, licenses associated with models like OpenAI. Um, so if you're not familiar with ChatGPT, um, you use an API to get at this stuff. Um, but Microsoft owns all the rights behind the scenes to this. And it's documented in this license. So whether it's a custom license, I'm not sure, or one with exception, but this is uh, something that we're going to have to get clearer as we're documenting um, AI discussions. Again, um, Within the uh, AI world, there's a lot about how you trained your data, what are the biases of your data that need to be defined in the SBOM. And then uh, we're still, as I say, there's a ton of um, uh, sort of more models and more exposure, um, again, uh, AI itself is is relatively complex, um, and to be able to do an S bomb for an AI or or the data itself will um, will need more sort of fine tuning. Um, but I will flag because I think some folks believe that. AI and data are tied together and could be defined. But as uh, things are happening out there, people are using 
data for multiple models, and they use the same thing. Models use multiple different data sets. So we have to separate them and package them separate um, so that as they roll out and start to get used by other folks, um, that they um, are able to know uh, that that one, one component by itself and all the vulnerabilities. So again, I don't know if there's any questions, but I wanted to just expose that um, uh, AI is different. So I, you know, I come from a compiler traditional uh, traditional code, but this. Um, it changes as life goes on. And, and so we're going to have to figure out how we're going to document that in an S bomb. So, one question, then, then yeah. we'll take questions. So, my question is about so, in any large scale language model, right, or any AI model, you have an algorithm that does uh, continuous learning, but it does learning based on certain data sets. So how do we account for when we find a data set was poisoned or corrupted and you want to take it out in an SBOM format? So you, sh you need to carry the information about data used so you can revert back and take out the anomaly. Right. So it, that's a challenge. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, the problem is, uh, as a developer, um, knowing sort of when you take it back, it typically right now is being triggered by a pretty severe vulnerability out there. Um, I think folks, you know, Tesla, the cars, et cetera, when uh, sort of a, a bad accident happens, they're pulling uh, it off the market and, and like the autopilot right now, I think is off the market or the version that was out there. Um, we need a simpler way. My, myself, I was with a startup company where we actually, as software or AI models were being produced out, out in the, the, live, the world, um, we have a monitoring system. And if any of the metrics um, go awry, like, you know, some of these chat bots go, you know, bias or whatever the words you want to use, um, we then a signal to a developer that that should be considered to be actually pulled off the market. Um, so it's really this lifelong learning and monitoring that is crucial for AI applications. Do you want to add? Yeah. Also, the uh, dataset profile field has a few fields called um, known biases. So as, as they get documented, and depending on if you want to use that particular AI system for your purpose, you, it lets you, it, it helps guide your decision. And as things keep getting locked there, you have a way of ascertaining if that's something that's going to affect you or not. For instance, if you want to use a model that was trained on data set that has uh, not seen enough demography, which is a known bias there, then you can decide not to use it. And uh, a lot of fields in there will help. The idea is to get those data in there so that it helps you guide the decisions, both before putting it into your system and as you continue to use the system. Yeah. Shall we take the picture? Yeah. I think we're getting our picture taken now. <laughs> <laughs>